Hi, I'm Beth Wilson. I'm the co-host of STEM in 30, which is a television show for middle school students produced at the National Air and Space Museum. For today's Air and Space live chat, I am joined by Captain Tammy jo, Tammy jo Schultz, who is a US Navy uh, fighter pilot and currently a pilot for Southwest Airlines. I'm also joined by Dorothy Cochran, who is a pilot herself, but also a curator in our aeronautics division. Uh, Dorothy, Tammy, Joe, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for the invitation. And for everybody who is watching online, please put your questions in the comments section and we will get to as many of as many of them as we can today. Also, let us know where you're watching from and we'll try and give you a shout out. Tammy Joe, I'm going to start with you and we're going to start with a story that everybody wants to hear. Tell us about how you and your crew landed Southwest Flight 1380. Well, as, as you mentioned, it was a crew effort. I was the captain, but I certainly wasn't alone. Like most of aviation, it is a crew, uh, a team sport. So Darren Ellisar was my first officer. Shanique Mallory, Rachel Fernheimer, and Catherine Sandoval were my flight attendants. And it started out as a normal day when the engine exploded as we were climbing uh, through 32,000, almost at 33,000 feet. Uh, Darren and I both thought we'd been hit by another aircraft. The jolt was so, uh, so violent. And the nose pitched over, the aircraft skidded sideways, and it went into a snap roll to the left. Uh, Darren and I both caught it going past 40 degrees and leveled the wings. And uh, for just a moment, we could see that the number one engine was rolling back and then we couldn't see anything. Uh, there was such a shuddering in the aircraft that we couldn't focus our eyes on our instruments or our checklists and then a, a kind of a cloud of smoke and condensation, condensation uh, filled the cockpit. And then there was a noise that just smothered every other sound. And so at that point, uh, we, we really had a moment of, of just maintaining control of the aircraft. To, uh, to put it kind of in just a thumbnail sketch, there were a lot of things that had happened. The number one engine had had a fan blade in. Uh, fail and that had shredded the outside of the the cowling of the engine and the air traffic control later told me that they they followed the bigger pieces with radar down to where they found them in Pennsylvania but uh, whenever those came off uh, in such a dynamic fashion like it it uh, damaged some parts of the aircraft the leading edge of the wing was chewed up and the tails the fuselage was hit and um, the the one uh, most damaging hit that we took was to a window and as we got closer to the ground we realized that uh, with that much damage on the left side we weren't able to use very much of our power from the right engine we'd had hydraulic lines cut fuel lines cut and we we just had to reevaluate everything as we got uh, over Philadelphia proper and realized that uh, there wasn't a level off capability to our aircraft and maintain control. So we, we had to re-evaluate re and plot more of a Boeing 737 glider path to the runway. But I will say incredible crew and, and passengers who got up at their own peril, left their families and their oxygen masks to help a stranger who needed help. Um, Andrew Needham, Tim McGinty, and Peggy Phillips. Uh, my, my hat's off, I just, there were so many heroes that day. And as we got on the ground, we saw more people doing uh, wonderful things to help, help each other out. Dorothy, as a museum, why is it important for us to share these stories with the public? Because no one wants to think about uh, having to make an emergency landing when they get on an airplane. 
Well, it's important for us to do this because we want to explain what's happening, what aviation is all about. You know, we always want to think about something that's flying the fastest or highest or farthest and all the great, great moments. But there are also moments of reality when things happen. And it's our duty to also tell about those historic stories as well and how people manage when something will go wrong because you know aviation, as we know, is incredibly safe. So safe because there are all kinds of redundancies and all of the personnel certainly embodied by Tammy and her crew have been trained so well, but you know, stuff happens. And so what we wanna do is you know, acknowledge that, but, and we're interested too in what happened, what went wrong, what went right. And just the fact that so many people walked away and it's just one of those moments, you know, it's one of those things where people remember, wow, I remember hearing about that. And, you know, what really happened? And so we want to have that kind of information available just to talk about all the different aspects of aviation and, and you know, just what life is all about. Well, we've got a lot of people watching from Memphis in Texas, Florida, Denmark, Madison, Wisconsin, Montana, Nebraska, Brazil, West Virginia, Ohio, Serbia, Argentina, and Arizona. Thank you all for tuning in today. Please keep asking those questions. We will get to as many of them as we can. Tammy Jo, uh, one of the first questions that we've got in is for you. Um, what was your most pivotal moment as a pilot before the landing that you're now famous for? Um, little moments. I would, I would have to say, uh, it was long before I even got to Southwest. Um, the little moment as a pilot was when really, I think when I got pulled from the lineup that all my peers were in to teach guns and sent to teach out of control flight, um, the new skipper that had taken over the squadron, wasn't happy about having uh, a woman in his instructor ranks. And so I was given the worst duty possible, <clears throat> excuse me, and it turned out to be the best training I ever had. Uh, taking the aircraft up and departing it and having the student recover. If they couldn't recover, then I recovered. And one day we had mechanical that we didn't know we had a mechanical yet. And instead of our stall, our aircraft stalling, it went into a spiral. And in that spiral, there were no procedures in our T2, T2 manual to get out of a spiral. And I remember just trying a number of things. And um, I, I can say, just just having that moment of realizing, you know, you're, you think you're in control, but and you just kind of, just like when you're learning to read and this big word comes up and you don't know it, you go back to basics and you go to your phonics. And in aviation, I think that problem solving goes back to aerodynamics and uh, gravity, you know, mechanical things that you've learned along the way that you can pull in. And uh, so anyway, just trying different airfoils and, and things we, we were able to get out of the spiral. But I, I think that was one of those pivotal times for me to realize you may not have something happen that is a recipe emergency, but if you've learned the tools along the way, you can use them in a different way to solve a different problem. Dorothy, there's a question coming in. Um, are there plans uh, to start highlighting highlighting more women in aviation, I, I think in particular uh, at the museum uh, as we go under this this uh, renovation. Absolutely, um, you know we are redoing every gallery. Uh, we have many many new galleries coming online. I'm working on a new one on general aviation, and what we all are doing is making sure that we have everybody who's involved with in aviation. In, represented in these galleries. 
So yes, we are going to have more women. We're going to have, you know, just with the broad spectrum of everybody who's participating because everybody's got great stories and has had some sort of experiences, whether it's maybe not quite as dramatic as Tammy Joe's, but worth telling. Um, and, you know, incremental things along the way as to how people contributed to the advancement of air and space. So every new gallery is going to be much broader than, um, you know, in the earlier years because aviation is now so much broader. And the, the great thing is that, it's, that it's open to everyone. And we wanna tell all those stories from the first people who came in, women or minorities, what their stories were like to what it's like today and just energize everybody and let them know that aviation is open to everybody and it's it's just a great great career to consider and and i don't don't mean just pilots but all types of work in aviation and space and you know i i have to say on my way down from thirty-two thousand feet there were a number of snap decisions that uh that we had to make and that i had to make and there would, I could name four different decisions that I made without having to think about it because I knew of somebody else's story. Mm -hmm. uh, right towards the end of the flight, we had added a little bit of power on the right, uh, enough that we couldn't add any more, but it was enough that I couldn't get the aircraft to turn right into the power. And we had 90 degrees more turn before we could line up with the runway. And so, uh, that was a there was a silence on ATC as well in the cockpit whenever uh, I was trying to turn and nothing was happening. And I remember Al Hayes and his asymmetrical thrust. Mm -hmm. And asymmetrical thrust was my problem, but it was also my answer. And so I pulled back the power that I had. I needed, but I could still uh, cut in. If I could turn my nose in, then I could turn tighter into the field and just uh, trade altitude for airspeed. But I just, I, I have to say, whenever we learn somebody else's story, that's one of those tools in our in our toolbox that you never know when you'll need. Exactly. Uh, Tammy Jo, somebody has always wanted to ask you, uh, since you were a Navy pilot, do you have to fight the urge to slam the 737 on the <laughs> runway to try and catch the number three wire? <laughs> Okay, now that's a little malevolent question there. Um, <laughs> you know, there, there are days when we park well and days when we don't. But uh, no, I've been practicing flaring for 26 years now. And um, I, I will say the na my Navy roots come out every once in a while if it's a slick runway or uh, something like that. So I apologize for whoever gave you a Navy style <laughs> landing and we hope to do better. <laughs> I once had to land in a larger plane on the shorter runway here at DCA. And boy, we they warned us and we hit the ground. And when I left, I looked, the pilot was out and I looked at him and I said, are you Navy? And he goes, yeah. <laughs> <So> <laughs> that was his moment. Uh, Dorothy, tell us a little bit about uh, some of the uh, women in the collection that uh, you'd like to highlight while we're talking about uh, flying today? Well, of course, everyone's familiar with Amelia Earhart and we do have her Lockheed Vega in the collection and it will be returning to our Pioneers of Flight Gallery. And that is the actual aircraft in which she became the first woman to solo the Atlantic. And her story is pretty well known and we've got a lot more to say about it. So we're excited about that. But next to that in Pioneers is a plane called the Lockheed Sirius and with a name Tingma Sartok, um, which is, uh, was a, a name given to this airplane by an Eskimo. And this plane was owned by Charles and Ann Lindbergh when they did survey flights to um, create the uh, commercial airline routes that Tammy Joe and others are flying today. And when Charles uh, was picked, uh, he's working with Pan Am and they said, we want you to do these flights, you know, who's your co-pilot? And there are all these great male co-pilots that were dying to fly with Charles Lindbergh. He said, no, I'm picking my wife, Anne. Anne is going with me. She's got her pilot's license. 
you know, she's going with me and, uh, you know, she's going to work the radios. She's going to help with navigation. And, you know, she just did a fantastic job with all this, so much so that she earned um, some prizes and medals and things like that. But, you know, when they, when they first were leaving, some of the men were looking at the, at the uh, some people were looking at the charts where they were going to fly over unchartered territory, which is what this was all about because there were no airports. And they looked at him and they said, well, I wouldn't take my wife on a trip like that. And he just looked back at them and he said, well, you must remember she is crew. <laughs> I love that story. Uh, we have people watching in Knoxville, Tennessee, New Mexico, Cross, Jun Cross Junction, Virginia, and in Ecuador. Uh, and apparently we have another aviator, naval avi aviator, who is watching. So everybody get these questions in. Uh, we've got two great guests that are ready to answer your questions today. And Tammy, Joe, tell us a little bit about your time um, as a fighter pilot. You were one of the first women to be uh, a Navy fighter pilot. Am I correct in saying that? You know, you know I, I have to say, coming up through the A-7, and being air to ground, um, I always hesitated at being called a Navy fighter pilot. I flew the F-18, and okay. that is a fighter. So, uh, you know, I suppose, yes, that's that's true. Our squadron, we were, at, I, I flew at a time before women were allowed in combat. So uh, I was so fortunate that all the other uh, military branches shut their doors when I tried to apply, and the Navy was the only one that would let me. And it turned out that the Navy was the only one that opened up to women flying combat aircraft in non-combat roles years before it was open. So I did fly the A-7. I had an incredible uh, commanding officer named Rosemary Mariner, who was in the first class of women to fly in the Navy, and the first woman aviation skipper. So she was, uh, she always had a, a look for the future and she took a couple of us, Pam Lyons, Carol and I, and sent us to do A7 weapons even before women were allowed to. And it's, I, Pam and I always joke about, I'm not sure if it was to prove that we could or prepare us for when we should, but um, having done weapons uh, well, we moved on to F-18s about a year later. And Dorothy, you too are a pilot. Do you want to tell us a little bit about what you fly and how you got interested in flying? Well, it's, it is interesting because I really didn't know a lot about aviation when I came to the Air and Space Museum. I was very fortunate to be hired, you know, and to be able to learn about it uh, on the job, basically. But one thing I realized when I was um, a researcher and a museum specialist was that I needed to know more. And the way to do that, I figured, was to get my pilot license. So, you know, I had friends on the staff who were flying. They had been taking me flying and I enjoyed it. And everyone just said, well, you know, you got to get your license. And it, it also went as far as the folks who were restoring the aircraft, because some of them were World War II mechanics and they weren't used to having women you know, in aviation at all. And so once I got my license, they took me a lot more seriously and I could talk to them about the airplanes that we were working on. And they, you know, then we had a real, uh, you know, back and forth um, professional narrative going on. So I did it partially for that, but also for the fun of it. It's just a lot of fun. And, you know, I'm a VFR pilot, which is visual flight rules only. So I'm flying very small single engine airplanes um, and you know it's a whole different ball game, but it just shows there's so many different levels of aviation. Tammy jo has gone all the way up to the top and she, you know flown them all. Um, I'm still having a good time puddle jumping around here. And one of the things I like to do with my friends is we'll decide on a Saturday or a Sunday to go get crab cakes across the Eastern shore. So we, you know, we, we talk to different pilots at different locations. We get on Facebook or wherever. We say we're gonna meet at Easton or at Cambridge or wherever, uh, you know, at noon or one o'clock and everybody shows up and we all have a great time and then everybody flies home again. So that's, that's part of the joy of flying. 
I will say uh, I did take a discovery flight uh, last year. I am not cut out to be a pilot, so I admire both of you and you're welcome. You will never see me flying a small plane again. Uh, Cam, uh, Caden from Kansas wants to know if Tammy Joe served on an aircraft carrier and which one? I, I didn't serve on an aircraft carrier. Now I did spend some time on one. Uh, again, my time frame was before women were um, allowed in squadrons that, that stayed there. But as an instructor pilot, I taught carrier landings. And so whenever we would practice up and then go out to the carrier, I spent a week or a two week out on the Lexington. Uh, so the USS Lexington is the only one that I've spent any time on. Now I did, uh, I did fly out to uh, another carrier. I used to sing the Star Spangled Banner or change of command. So uh, when my, my husband, Skipper, uh, had a change of command, I did go out, but I didn't fly myself. I was in the cod when I went on that one. So the Lexington, USS Lexington, is the one that I did my traps and cat shots on and that I taught on. I will yeah, say- I oh, go, go ahead, Dorothy. I was just gonna say, I had a chance to go on to the JF Kennedy uh, carrier and uh, I did so I have a trap and a, a catapult shot off oh, of a very nice yeah and uh, spent the night and I'll tell you there's nothing like watching those planes come in I am in total awe of all of you Taylor <laughs> <laughs> just to, totally amazing it was marvelous it's if you want psychology I mean if, if you sent somebody out there to do it by themselves they may not do it but it's a formation you have to just People have done it before you, they'll do it after you. <laughs> mm -hmm. And if you want to learn more about life on an aircraft carrier, there is um, a STEM in 30 uh, about, uh, we spent some time on the USS Dwight D. Eisenhower. Uh, so check that out. Uh, and that'll, that's got a lot of information about how, you know, the pilots do are doing all the landing. But there are a lot of people on that ship. It's got to run like a very well-run city. It's amazing. So uh, check out that STEM in 30. Um, somebody's eight-year-old daughter wants to fly jet fighters. Any words of encouragement? She's already saving uh, money from her birthday. Uh, oh. And she wants to buy her own plane by the time she's 16. All right. Well, I think both of you can uh, address wanting to own your own plane. So, <laughs> Well, you know what? I will say uh, good for you. First of all, just having a direction. It's just like anything else in life. If you don't know where you want to go, you can, you can wander around aimlessly for quite some time. So I, I have to say anything that you do, eight years old, 18 years old, whether you're involved in music or sports or um literature, anything that you do, it helps to develop the tools that you'll need in, in piloting. I mean, reading, I would say, would be one of the most uh, crucial things you can do in life, let alone piloting. But problem solving, things, you know, getting out there and, and ask your parents for a job, ask them for some chores, have some responsibility, something that you have some weight on your own shoulders to do is a great practice for piloting. And there's a great, uh, there's so many places. The women in aviation have scholarships, the Young Eagles in EAA. Whenever you get to a certain age, you can go there, uh, log on to EAA, Young Eagles. You'll find a Young Eagle close by, a Young Eagle pilot close by. He'll give you, he or she will give you a free ride sign you up for free ground school, and then you'll get a free lesson. So uh, there's no reason you can't try it. Dorothy, uh, I know that you are involved with a lot of uh, aviation groups. Uh, is there any advice that you can give this young girl uh, about what other groups that she might look into? Yeah, to follow on with Tammy Jo said, uh, these days there are so many uh, areas, uh, so many organizations that have youth programs. Uh, you know, she mentioned EAA, Experimental Aircraft Association. There's Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association. Um, the, the 99s, which is a marvelous group of women pilots. 
um, you know, all of these groups, uh, and then there are so many group things in, in schools as well, but all of these groups, if you uh, just go online, there's uh, the General Aviation Manufacturers Association, National Business Aviation Association, they all have youth things. And uh, there are chapters of Women in Aviation, 99's um, uh, uh, EAA, and they have a lot of different open houses, a lot of different opportunities for kids. Um, you know, we hold open houses, of course, at the museum uh, and any aviation museum near anybody uh, undoubtedly has some of these. And a lot of airports also have uh, programs for kids. And so it's just, you know, uh, get out there, get educated and figure out, you know, what it is you might want to do. And you can take a flight or maybe you'd rather work on an airplane. You know, it's, you don't have to just be a pilot. There are so many different things. Um, one thing that I'm going to have in our new gallery on general aviation is um, entry points, we're going to call it. And I've listed about 25 different jobs that people can do in aviation. And that can be being, you know, a photographer or an artist but you're involved in aviation and there's just no better group of people. I mean, we just have so much fun and there's so many great opportunities. So it's just a matter of getting, getting resources together, getting educated and it'll, it'll come along. You know, you, I feel like for me, I didn't know I was gonna be involved in aviation and here I've been involved with it now for 40 years. <laughs> Dorothy, you mentioned the 99s. That's kind of an interesting group in history. Do you wanna tell us a little bit about them? Yeah, they, uh, they came together uh, quite a long time ago when there were very few women in aviation. Um, there was a, a group of women in 1929 who flew on the first women's air derby. And that was a cross country flight from Santa Monica, California to Cleveland, Ohio. And it was part of the whole national air races, which was a big deal in the 20s and 30s. Uh, aviation was wildly popular, but it was pretty much all men. So there were a few women like Amelia Earhart, uh, Ruth Nichols, Louise Thaden, Pancho Barnes. They wanted to prove that they could fly. And so they did this very long and dangerous cross country flight. And uh, Louise Thaden won uh, that particular um, uh, fight uh, competition, but afterwards, they all kind of got, had been talking with each other, flying with each other, and they said, we want to stay in touch, and we want to find out about jobs, and I can encourage you on this and that, and I can help you buy maybe this airplane, or I know so-and-so. They were networking, and they wanted to keep it going, so they got together and formed an organization. They sent out uh, inquiries to all the women pilots that they knew of, and they got uh, 99 people coming back saying, oh, we're interested in an organization. 27 of them met in Valley Stream, New York, uh, late, about a month or two after the 29 Derby, that, which was in July, and they created this group, the women's, first Women's Pilots Association. And because there were 99 women interested, they decided they didn't want to be called the ladybirds or the bluebirds or whatever. They just said, we'll be the 99s. And so it was all networking, camaraderie. You know, you can only imagine these women flying around the country and they are the only woman pilot for hundreds of miles. And how are they treated? You know, how are they able to even get an airplane? You know, it's very expensive. They don't have the same access to aviation that men have because men can be in the military. They can fly commercial planes. At this point, women cannot. So it was incredibly important um, in bringing together those early women pilots. And then it's just evolved uh, today to still be, you know, to being just a marvelous organization that, that helps women in all different manners. Tammy Joe, someone would like for you to discuss how you study for a new aircraft and your process of getting ready for those check rides. I am, I'm a studier. Uh, I know some people can read through and it just kind of assimilates, but I, I make my own flashcard and I usually take them with me walking uh, or if I'm jogging on the treadmill or something and and I flash through them. I like to diagram. Um, I think it, it, it happened just because I was, I was required to diagram the electronic, uh, the electrical system, the fuel system, the hydraulic system, 
all the different systems that we have, uh, usually my male peers were not diagramming, but I think the challenge to me was, all right, if you think you know it, let me see you diagram whatever system. And I realized through that, that it really helps me so much to have that knowledge of that diagram in my mind. Now, as they've gotten more complex through the years, I keep an outline of that diagram in my mind, but just understanding where the bus tiebreaker is and what a transformer rectifier does and where it lies in the electrical system and things like that, it really helps me to make decisions when something isn't working right or we're troubleshooting. And uh, so I, I literally look at what I have to accomplish. I take time. I don't just dive in. I look at it see how much and make a list and then I chop up my list and divide it into the days starting with checklist or when I'm going to be having my first flight in that uh, aircraft or first simulator and I back it up to where I'm at and divide it up and I I just as my husband says I eat the elephant one bite at a time <laughs> <laughs> Tammy Jo there are a lot of people who want you to talk about your book well, you know, I will say I heard that there was someone from Denmark that was watching and it's currently being translated to be uh, in Denmark in Danish. Uh, oh, good. So that's kind of exciting. I, I hope I get to come over. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, I, I hope that my book does for someone what an aviation book did for me because it was reading a book. I was in junior high when I read uh, Bush Pilot, um, or I'm sorry, Jungle Pilot, about a bush pilot in Ecuador named Nate Saint. And for me, I don't know about some of you, but for me, whenever I read something, I tend to internalize it and it becomes my own. And so I felt like I got to see aviation through a pilot's eyes. Now, I could see the, the Air Force jets anchoring their dogfighting practice over our big hay barn, but I couldn't imagine what it was like doing it or how to get there. And reading that but one book just seemed to open up all those doors in my mind. I, I had a cockpit view of aviation. And so uh, that's what I hope that my book does for the younger uh, group that read, read it. And then for the rest of us, um, I think, the adventure of life sometimes when it's not even adventurous, just life itself and what you may see some reflections of your childhood in that. Um, and, and then realizing that uh, adventure will always have adversity in it. And honestly, that's part of what is thrilling is how you overcome that adversity. And you never walk away from an, an adventure unchanged. It always uh, moves you along the, the road in life. And so you're better prepared to meet the next challenge, the big next challenge, which may be bigger. And so I, I also, when it comes to the end of the book and Flight 1380, there's so many of the different passengers that I've, I've loved being able to keep in touch with. And I was hoping that through pulling together some of those puzzle pieces, both uh, Andrew Needham, one of the gentlemen that helped in the back, uh, he stepped in and gave kind of a cabin point of view. And then my cockpit point of view and what we were looking at and dealing with and planning on and replanning, it would help put the puzzle pieces together for the people who were on that flight. Uh, and a lot of times when you can finish the puzzle, you can set it aside. And so uh, I hope that my book really winds up showing that our habits and the hope that we have the ability to give, that's really what makes heroes is just, just people that are willing to take the time to see and the effort to act on behalf of somebody else. Yeah, Dorothy, to follow up on books, because people are looking for things to read, uh, you did mention the Lindbergh trip, uh, which Anmar Lindbergh then turned into North to the Orient, which is one of my favorites. Uh, are there other 
uh, pilot writers or books that you could recommend for people who are doing some summer reading? Well, yeah, you mentioned in Lindbergh's North to the Orient, that was for the 1931 flight. And then they also did a 33 flight, which uh, the first one went to the Orient, now known as Asia. Uh, the second one was flights to Europe, trying to find survey uh, air, air, airways to Europe. And that one uh, is called Listen the Wind. So those two really tell you about that middle part of aviation um, that was just such a marvelous time when people were still flying close to the ground and there were all these different things that happened. We didn't have any of the sophisticated aircraft that we have today. And it was really a challenge, but she captures that just marvelously. And then, you know, there are so many other people who have done biographies uh, about their types of flying. Um, and so, you know, everybody from Tammy Joe to some other military women, um, you know, there's, there's just a whole lot of great aviation books out there. You know, Ernest Gann did some, of course, Charles Lindbergh, uh, you know, all the great pilots pretty much either wrote a book or wrote about them, or somebody wrote about them as well. So uh, I'm trying to think there's, there's- I, I uh, just finished uh, for the second time and I rarely read a book twice but I just finished West with the Night by Pearl oh, Markham. Right. Unbelievable. It's in my top five books of my life. Yeah. It is fabulous. It's like yeah. dark chocolate. It's just <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. There so are, there, there are a lot of great aviation books out there. Really so are. There's a lot of good literature out there. Uh, there was a question from Bill who wanted to know if, and I just lost it, so I'll move on to something else. Um, Sorry, Bill. It's a, uh, oh, here it is. As a commercial pilot, uh, do you fly with different crews, uh, and do you train individually as a uh, for? Do you train individually or as a crew for emergencies? We I fly with different people every week, and in fact, I had one flight attendant traded out halfway through the day. This week, today, I just landed from a three-day trip. And the first day, I had a change-up of flight attendants. And the second day, I had the same ones all day. And then the third day, I had a change-up in the middle of the day. So we really are kind of moving puzzle pieces, but they fit. And first officers and captains usually fly a week together, sometimes a whole month. But uh, we trade around a lot. And we train individually. Uh, we study individually. And then cockpit crews are matched for about a three or four day time frame where you go through emergencies together. But you may never fly with them on the line. It's just they're at the simulator building doing emergencies together. And the flight attendants, they, they work together the same way. Uh, but we don't, uh, at this point, we don't really get together to do emergencies. Uh, it's well blended in that we know uh, how to fold in with one another, but so often, as in my case, uh, there was nothing that I could do for them other than at one point slow down. Uh, there was one or two calls for us to slow down so that they could get the passenger back in. But uh, other than that, I just had to trust, and I did. I had met my la my ladies beforehand, and they the way they treated passengers made me comfortable that they were going to take good care of them. So I don't worry about what's going on in the back. It's really a mechanical and, and physics game for me up front. I, one of the things that I heard uh, after uh, uh, Flight 1380 came down, uh, and I will address both of you about this, is that people kept saying, oh, she was so calm. She was so, and, and I thought, well, that, that's her job. You know, they are calm, they're working through. So can each of you tell me a little bit about, you know, that training that goes into either learning, you know, to fly small aircraft or a larger one. So that, that you're like, this, this is my job. My job is to put this, get this plane up and put it down. So uh, Tammy, Jody, we want to start a little bit, talk about training and then uh, Dorothy can follow sure. up. Sure, I, 
I love that Aristotle quote that we are what we repeatedly do. And so if you, uh, if you repeatedly get flustered or uh, I kind of tease my first officers if they tend to cuss, uh, which they don't continue to do for very long. But I just say, you know, that language just makes it sound like you've lost your cool. Just don't. And um, the training, certainly, and we talked a little bit about it earlier, the problem solving with, with tools. Um, there's very few emergencies that have been just by the book. You know, I had my engine wind down. So then I did my, you know, my single engine procedures. And it never happens where you think it'll happen. So having those, uh, having a toolkit to use. And um, I have to be really honest, when all that happened and we couldn't breathe, we couldn't see anything, we couldn't um, uh, hear anything, that's a very isolating moment. And I think everybody had adrenaline pump in. I'm sure I did. And adrenaline can make your mind work really fast. Uh, and yet you feel like you're leisurely in your thought process. And I remember thinking that this may be the day I meet my maker because I don't know that everything is going to stay on that I need until I get this to a runway. When the tearing of the aircraft happened, it didn't just tear and stop tearing. It exploded. The tear made more things tear. And we had these big pieces of engine cowling that were just uh, flailing in 500 mile an hour wind, kind of like a barn door in a hurricane effect at the wing route. So, and, and everything changed all the way until we landed. There was never a point where it was a steady kind of a shudder. And I do remember thinking, maybe the day I meet my maker. And then that speed train of thought just stopped short of those cliffs of what if. And I thought, I won't be meeting a stranger. And I stepped away with a peace and a calm to face what I needed to do. And all the training and the experience definitely play a huge part. The calm, I would have to say, was, was a gift. And I don't feel like that was all of my own doing. Dorothy, what kind of training do you have, even for these smaller craft, that, you know, if there's a problem, you're going to have to be able to handle it? Well, one thing aviation is known for is checklists. And so, you know, even in a small single engine plane, you have a checklist about before you even get in the airplane, you're checking it all out to make sure that everything is right, that the oil is right, that the fuel is right, that everything is, is on the plane and it's working and you juggle things back and forth. Um, so you go down your checklist and you've learned all of this while being a student pilot. That's what being a student pilot in ground school are all about. And so you have to learn all about the airplane. You have to learn about its systems. And then you have to learn about all the different aspects of flight. And then you go through instruction and your instructor takes you through all these. So you don't do any of this on your own at first. You know, you learn to stall an aircraft and recover it. And you learn, you know, if, uh, all the different things that could go wrong and how to start managing. And that's exactly what Tammy Joe did, except on a much, much larger, <laughs> you know, craft. But it, it's all the same. And so when you get up there on your own, you know, when you first do your first solo, your first cross country, you're, you're very nervous. And, you know, I remember having some weather that wasn't so good. And, and I remember at one point that, you know, I thought I was flying properly. And then I looked on a heading and I realized, oh, if I keep going this way, I'm going to go out in the ocean. So I better turn, <laughs> you know, so um, you just have to follow all of these things. So it's, it's just one of those things where all the training, all the checklists, be, so it becomes second nature. And that's what kicked into Tammy Joe, And that's what kicks into all pilots. And you, of course, and people in all kinds of other professions, you have to really, you know, you have to, um, you know, make it, make it what you do. You have to learn every aspect of it so that you'll be safe. We have one last question um, from an eight-year-old. We don't have a name. Uh, the question is, uh, what do you enjoy most about flying? And Tammy Jo, let's let's start with you. What what do you enjoy most about flying? Um, it, it's kind of hard for me to single it out uh, because I enjoy 
I enjoy getting there. I enjoy, I, I guess if I had to kind of boil everything away, I love the compartmentalization of, of organizing and taming a, a thousand details into this economy of mind and motion. And I coach volleyball and javelin some. And one of the things I always tell my players is, this is your world. Nothing else matters. Right now, this is it. This is your whole world. And that's how it is in aviation. You get to dump off everything else in the world. You know, your house can be a mess. Your, you know, uh, you can have a, a, a list of to-dos a mile long. But when you get in the cockpit, that's done. It's a, I never let those things enter my mind. And it's so nice to have that little zone of freedom where all you think about is flying. And Dorothy and friend, I see we have friend now with us. <laughs> Dorothy, what, this is what's great about working from home. My cat sings opera. <laughs> Dorothy's got her grandchildren. Uh, what is the thing that you most enjoy about flying? You know, this sounds really silly, but I love the view. The view of the, uh, of, of the country, the view of the, of the earth from above, and I'm not flying very high. It just puts everything into perspective and you can see and understand so much about geography and and, you know, waterways and, you know, just weather, all of those things. It's just a spectacular view. And just to think that you're able to fly through the air like this and see all of these things and go to all these places and then just come back and everything's fine. And you've learned so much about where you went. You've had all these experiences. Um, so it's it's just a marvelous experience just being up in the air. And then piloting an aircraft, you know, gives you a, a sense of, of, you know, accomplishment, um, you know, that sort of thing. And, uh, you know, it's, it's just a, a great thing. Well, I want to thank you both for joining us today. And I want to thank everybody who is watching. We will have a live chat next week at a regular time. So please join in, uh, tune in and join us for that next week. And thanks for watching. And ladies, thanks for joining us. Thank you. thank you, Beth. Nice to see you, Dorothy. Good to see you, Jamie. Come visit. I will. <laughs>